The Bible says that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son. Just as God sent forth His Son, the first advent of Christ occurred when the fullness of the time was come. In the same way, when the fullness of the time occurs again, the second coming of Christ will occur. The question is, how close are we to this time when the fullness of the time will be again and Christ will come back to this earth again? In just a moment, we'll look at the answer. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. The Bible says in Galatians, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse, that when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. In the same way that God sent forth his son into the world, the first advent of Christ, when the fullness of time was come. In the same way, when the fullness of time has come again, God is going to send his son again. The second advent of Christ is going to occur. How close are we to that time? Are we about to the fullness of the time now? We'll look at that in a moment. But first, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us understand what we will read from His holy book. Father in heaven, we thank you for Bible prophecy that explains to us the meaning of what has happened in the past, why we are here now, and what is going to happen in the near future that will come to this world as a shocking surprise. And we pray that you will help us to understand the prophecies so that we might be ready for what is about to happen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's free offer is entitled, David Dare, A Journey from Unbelief to Belief. To receive your free copy, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM3. After becoming a Christian, David Dare would go into a city, advertise a meeting, and invite all classes of unbelievers to attend. David was so sure of his faith that he would let anyone interrupt him and ask him questions during the meetings, and these he promised to answer. The story of David Dare is a composite of these experiences and is based on actual facts. Call now to receive your free copy of David Dare, A Journey from Unbelief to Belief. Call now. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM3. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son to redeem those that were under the law. You read words like that in Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. This promise of redemption was actually given to the human race the very day that Adam and Eve sinned. You read in Genesis 3, verse 15, this message that God gave. He was speaking to the devil because the devil used a snake, a serpent, to deceive Eve. The snake or the serpent was cursed and the devil himself came to be called this ancient snake or serpent. You can read that in Revelation 12. The devil or Satan is called that ancient serpent because he used a serpent to deceive Eve, our first mother. And this is what God said to the devil in Genesis 3:15. He said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. When Adam and Eve first heard that promise, it came to them as a star of hope, and they looked forward to its speedy fulfillment. When Cain was born, their first son, Eve said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. They looked forward to the fulfillment of the promise that a descendant of Eve would crush the serpent's head and restore the human race back to paradise. But Cain didn't do it. He became the world's first murderer. In the days of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the promise was repeated. In fact, 
the words of Enoch are quoted in the book of Jude in the New Testament and then through patriarchs and later through prophets. The promise was repeated over and over again of the coming of a deliverer, a coming of a savior. You find these promises renewed over and over again to God's chosen people in the Old Testament. And in the time of Daniel, even the time when the Savior would come was predicted. You can read that in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. It was predicted the time when the coming of the Messiah, the Christ, would occur. But that was several hundred years before Christ came and century after century passed away and the voices of the prophets ceased and the hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel. And there were many people saying just what Ezekiel wrote in chapter 12 of his book, the days are prolonged and every vision fails. But just as the stars in heaven follow a prescribed path and they know no haste or delay in the same way, the purposes of God are always on time and cannot be delayed when the time is fulfilled. In the fullness of the time, the scripture says, God sent forth his son. God's purposes know no haste and no delay. When Jesus was born, the world had been prepared for a redeemer. How? Well, the world, the nations were united under one government. Not only this, but one language was widely spoken throughout the civilized world and was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. And not only this, the Jews came from various parts of the world to Jerusalem for their annual feasts and went back to where they lived. And so the way was open for them to carry the news back to all parts of the world concerning the Messiah's coming. Not only that. But at that time, the systems of heathenism were losing their hold upon the people. People wanted something more than ritual and ceremony. They wanted some assurance. Is there really life after the grave? The words of the prophets, though, were uncomprehended. People didn't understand what happens after death. It was a dread mystery to them. And so the principles of God's government had to be made plain. The plan of salvation must be clearly defined so that you could know what do I need to do to inherit eternal life. When the fullness of time came, even though humanity had been degraded by ages of transgression, God sent forth His Son. How did humanity become so degraded in the days of Christ? Well, it was through heathenism. Satan for ages had turned men away from God. But the devil won his biggest triumph by perverting the faith of Israel. You see, the heathen people, they were contemplating and worshiping the works of their own hands, idols that they had made. The heathen had lost the knowledge of God. They'd become, as a result, more and more corrupt. But now, what had happened to Israel? The principle had been instituted even in Israel that a man can be saved by his own works. This principle was the foundation, actually, if you study religious history, this was the foundation of all false religion. And now it had become the principle of the Jewish nation. Satan had implanted this principle because anywhere where men believe that, they have no barrier against sin. <clears throat> the Jews had sought to make a monopoly of the truth, which will bring eternal life. They had hoarded the living manna, and it had turned to corruption. And so what had happened is that the people whom God had made the pillar and ground of the truth <clears throat> had become representatives of the character of Satan. In fact, Jesus called them the sons of the devil, as you can read in John 8:44. Why was that? Because they were doing the work that Satan wanted them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and to cause the world to look upon God as a tyrant. So the deception of sin had reached its height. Sin had become a science and vice was consecrated 
as a part of religion. The only way out was if a new element of life and power could be imparted by the person who made the world. When Jesus was born, there was corruption and defiance in every part of the world. But a way for its recovery, the recovery of a lost planet gone in rebellion, the way for its recovery was provided. At the very crisis when it looked like Satan was about to triumph, the Son of God came on a mission of divine mercy and grace. The deity was glorified when Jesus came to this world by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace and power that was never to be obstructed until the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. The devil exalted that he had degraded men and women by sin, by idolatry. But Jesus came to restore in the human heart the image of the divine maker. Actually, there is no one, if you study all the religions of the world, you will find that there is no one but Christ who can fashion anew the character that has been ruined by sin. Why did Jesus come? Oh, friend, he came to expel the demons that had controlled the minds, the will of men and women. He came to lift us up from the dust, to reshape the marred character after the pattern of his divine character, and to make your character beautiful with his own glory. Do you know, friends, that we are coming to the fullness of time again, just as the world did before the first coming of Christ? The scriptures picture the world just before the second coming of Christ as being in a very similar condition to the world just before the first coming of Christ. Now, it is obvious, you can tell from studying history, and we have just reviewed it, that just before the first coming of Christ, the people had a form of religion, but they did not comprehend the words of the prophets. The same condition is prophesied for the last days. Notice what Isaiah said about it. In Isaiah, the 60th chapter, and verse 2, it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. So, is the world dark today? Oh, Jesus predicted that his second coming would occur at the darkest period of world history. In 2 Timothy, Paul talks about the forms of religion that people have in the last days while they deny the power. Notice what he says. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And then he says, For a man will be lovers of themselves, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Are we approaching midnight? Yes, the evidence is very strong that we are. Stay tuned, we'll give you some more evidence. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Welcome back. Just as the world was very dark, that is spiritually dark, just before Jesus came the first time, 
Jesus predicts that the world will be very dark just before he comes the second time. Notice what Jesus taught in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13, in his parable of the ten virgins. Notice, they were expecting Christ to come, but they were expecting the bridegroom to come. But it did not happen until midnight, until the very darkest hour. So, the second coming of Christ, it will occur in the fullness of time, just like the first coming of Christ occurred in the fullness of time. It will occur in the darkest period of earth's history. Jesus pictured the days of Noah, when every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually and the earth was corrupt and filled with violence, as you read in Genesis 6, verses 5 and 10. Jesus said that's the way it'll be when the Son of Man is revealed again. The same as in the days of Lot. Jesus said it would be like it was in the days of Lot. Notice what it was like in the days of Lot. Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50, it says, Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw fit. So, those are descriptions that Jesus used the days like it was in the days of Noah, like it was in the days of Lot. That's the way it's going to be, Jesus said, when the Son of Man is revealed. In the fullness of time, when the second coming occurs, the world will be like it was in the days of Noah and like it was in the days of Lot. Not only that, the Scriptures point forward to the time just before Jesus comes again and tell us that Satan will work in this world with all power. Notice what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, The coming of the lawless one, that's the Antichrist, is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Oh, friend, have you received the love of the truth that you might be saved? Or do you want to be saved in sin? That's the great lie that many people believe today, that they can go on and sin and sin and sin. Just keep your sins confessed and then you can be saved. Friends, that's not the gospel of the New Testament. The New Testament teaches that we are to overcome sin. Read Revelation 2 and 3. To every Christian church, their promise of salvation is only to the overcomer, the one that overcomes, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Here in 2 Thessalonians 2, these people who are deceived by the unrighteous deception because they didn't receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, what happens? It says in verses 11 and 12, and for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What is the lie? Oh, friend, the lie is the idea that you can be saved in sin. You cannot be saved in sin. Nobody can be saved in sin. Jesus can save you from your sins, Matthew 1.21. The angel said before Jesus was born, to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus or Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus can save you from your sins, but he cannot save you in your sins. The people that want to be saved in sin, that's the lie. What's going to happen to them? For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. What's the strong delusion? That they can be saved in their sins. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Oh, friend, if you have pleasure in unrighteousness, you're going to be taken by a deception that will take the whole world captive. What does it mean to have pleasure and unrighteousness? What is unrighteousness anyway? Look in 1 John, the 5th chapter and the 17th verse. It says, all unrighteousness is sin. 
All unrighteousness is sin. And sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of God's law. All unrighteousness is sin. And in the last days, there will be people that have pleasure in unrighteousness. In other words, they will have pleasure in sin. All unrighteousness is sin. All sin is breaking God's law. So they will have pleasure in breaking God's law. It says here in 2 Thessalonians, they will all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, friend, today we have something that's sort of opposite, rather opposite to what they had in Christ's day, what they had among the Jews. The Jews looked at the justice of God, but they forgot about the mercy of God. Today, we look at the mercy of God, but we forget about the justice of God. The devil claimed that God could not be both just and merciful, and there are many people who believe that today. That's the devil's lie. God is merciful. He can forgive your sins, but he is also just. He will not save you in sin. He will only save you if you're willing to be saved from sin. If you accept the devil's lie, it says here you will be condemned because the devil will come with all power and, and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the devil's working is plainly revealed today in the multitudinous errors, the rapidly increasing spiritual darkness, the various heresies and delusions of these last days that are taking the world captive. But not only is the devil taking the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ so that people are believing that they can be saved in sin which the New Testament never teaches. Jesus can save you from sin, but there is no salvation in sin. If you're not willing to turn away from sin, from breaking God's law, then there's no promise of salvation anywhere in the Bible. The deceptions of the devil are leavening the churches of our Savior, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this great apostasy that we see around the world today is going to develop into darkness that is as black as midnight, impenetrable. To God's people, it will be a night of trial. But out of that night of trial, God will have witnesses that will speak the truth so that anybody that wants to hear and wants to flee from sin can be saved. A second thing that is similar in our time to the way it was just before the coming of Christ the first time was the idea, or is the idea, the principle that you can be saved by your works. You see, there are some people that want to be saved in their sins, and there are other people that want to be saved by their works. But there is no work that you can do to gain salvation. Look in your Bible in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 12. You cannot gain salvation by giving money to any church or organization or good works or deeds of any kind. Salvation comes by grace alone, through faith. We see again today the principle, the idea that a man can be saved by good works is believed by millions of people around the world. And then, in Jesus' day, those who claimed to be God's children were misrepresenting His character, so much so that Jesus said they were the children of the devil in John 8, 44. They were misrepresenting the character of God so that when people looked at God, they saw the character of the devil instead of the character of God. This caused the world to look upon God as a tyrant. Do not millions of people today look upon God as a tyrant because of the doctrines that are taught by many Christians which impugn the character of God, making him look like the devil? For example, Jesus said that if you lived a life of sin, both your soul and body would be destroyed. You can read that in Matthew 10, 28. Not only that, 
it is predicted in Revelation 5.13 that the time will come when every creature in the world will be praising the Lord. They won't be cursing Him in the fires of hell. Every creature in the world will be praising the Lord. But there are many religionists today who contradict these biblical statements, teaching that sin will not result in death. The religionists teach that sin will not result in death, but rather it will result in eternal life, either in heaven or hell. But notice what the Bible says. Here in Obadiah, verses 15 and 16, it says, The day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had not been. They will be as though they had not been, the Bible says. And in Malachi, the fourth chapter, verse 3, it says, You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. See, the Bible doesn't teach an eternally burning hell. It, t it teaches that the wicked will be destroyed. The wages of sin is not eternal life and hellfire. The wages of sin is death, Paul said in Romans 6, 23. So we see today the same situation that there was in the days of Christ. Through religion, God has been misrepresented so that he looks like a tyrant and people hate him because they've been taught that if you do the wrong thing, that he will torture you forever. The Bible, of course, doesn't teach that. And then we see today rebellion and defiance of God. It is reaching a height never before achieved, just like it did before Christ came the first time. This same condition in the world is predicted to be in the last days just before Jesus returns again. You see it developing. For instance, in 2 Timothy 3.13, Paul said that evil men would become worse and worse. Evil men and imposters or seducers will become worse and worse, Paul said. Peter talked about the same thing. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verse 3, that in the last days there would come scoffers who would be walking after their own lusts. And then Jesus talked about it. Jesus said that in the last days we would be living in a time of great terror and terrorism. Notice what Jesus said in Luke 21. He said, On the earth there would be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear, and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. Yes, friend, Jesus said that the last days would be a time of great terror. He talked about it in Luke 21. And the apostles, of course, also talk about it. What's going to happen to you at the end of the world? What happens to you at the end is dependent on what you decide to do today. Will you have Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Today's free offer is entitled, David Dare, A Journey from Unbelief to Belief. To receive your free copy, call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM3. After becoming a Christian, David Dare would go into a city, advertise a meeting, and invite all classes of unbelievers to attend. David was so sure of his faith that he would let anyone interrupt him and ask him questions during the meetings, and these he promised to answer. The story of David Dare is a composite of these experiences and is based on actual facts. Call now to receive your free copy of David Dare, A Journey from Unbelief to Belief. Call now. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer IM3. Steps to life. We hope you have been as blessed by today's message as we have been in bringing it to you. We encourage you to contact us at Steps to Life Television with any questions or comments you might have. Check one, two. Check one, two. Don't forget to ask for today's free offer. Ready in five. Steps four. to Life Television, a ministry preparing a people for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Welcome, friends. He can change your life.